All right, if you would uh, take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 24. It's really good to be here with everybody here. And uh, I, st I feel kind of far away, it feels like, right? So um, this morning when, the, when we got together with some of the younger people, I was down here and I had a chance to ask a few questions and interact. Um, I sometimes I am crazy enough during the messages to ask questions. And uh, we'll see if some of you can answer some of these questions. All right, is that, uh, is that a fair pop proposition? If I ask questions, will you answer back? I know it might be a little different than a normal message, right? But after all, it is a Saturday, and um, I didn't put on a suit so that I didn't, wasn't so formal. James Chan came in with a suit and tie, and I said, I really feel underdressed all of a sudden because it just didn't seem right. So I might ask a few questions, and uh, hopefully some of you will be able to help me answer some of them. Uh, first question. Okay, I'm going to start out with the first question. How many of you were here last night? There's a few. Okay, for those of you who were last night, here's the question. Uh, Sam Uncle had a really good gospel message, and he talked about numbering our days, right? And he described it with five different descriptions. I brought this up at uh, breakfast this morning. I can only think of four of them off the top of my head, so I need help to figure out what the fifth one is. If I can't figure it out tonight, I'll have to call him and find out. Anybody remember what those four, at least four, maybe the fifth one? Our days are? For those who were here last night. Our days are? Jason, you were here last night, right? I can ask. Anybody? Jijin? Frailty. Frailty, that was one. It was a frustrating life, or days. It was futile. Anybody else? Hold on. That's, that was good. That was really good. He was, he was on top of things. <laughs> That's all you had. There's any more? Our days are few. I mentioned few, and I can't remember the fifth one. Anybody on the fifth one? Frail, we got that. Frustrating. Our days are few. Our days are futile. Maybe there was only four. Fragile. Yeah, it could be fragile. Yeah. That's true. The reason I bring it up is this. When we think about our days, Sam Uncle mentioned that he would, you know, we, we, we don't often think about what happens day to day in our life, right? It's by God's mercy that we live here on earth. And oftentimes, uh, you know, we think that we have long life. Oftentimes, it's not a very long life. Now, Recently, I should say recently, since we moved to Minnesota a couple many years ago, we have this little tradition as a family, and, and the tradition is after my mom passed away, we as a family would go to the cemetery at least twice a year and become a family tradition amongst our family with uh, my sister and everybody, and really to remember uh, her testimony and also remind our children who didn't necessarily know her all too well before she passed away and just talk about her testimony. Um, and over time, when you go to the same place, same cemetery all the time, we started noticing other tombstones, right? And uh, you go there and you go look at a tombstone and read the inscription on there, right? The epitaph that's on there. And you get an idea of, oh, the type of person they are based on what is written about them or some description about who that person may be. We even noticed this last year, after 10 years of visiting this place, there's a tombstone on the same area that had the last name of Trump. I was like, oh, we never noticed that before. So we had to look up if there's connections or not. We still don't know if there's a connection or not. But um, there, they, So you started noticing different things. I don't know how many of you have ever thought about it. What would your epitaph be? What would you like your epitaph to be? Right? Um, let me give you one example. This is Martin Luther King Jr.'s epitaph. Right? It says, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. We know this from the famous speech that he gives. Right? And as a result, you know the, the things that he was all about. It's a description of who he is. Um, when you look at different famous people, they have diff different epitaphs about who they are. Interestingly enough, notice the date that's on there. There's a little dash mark between 1929 on this particular one and 1968. Somebody mentioned 
That's the length of your life. At the end of the day. That's what people look at. Oh, that's how long their life was. Some of them may be shorter than others, but at the end of the day, it's nothing more than a little dash. Few in number and frail. Right? Now, I bring this up because if you would turn to Joshua chapter 24, we have an um, interesting scenario. We know the famous verse, right? We know the famous verse that talks about, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve, right? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you go to any Christian home, most often than not, there's a little plaque or designer thing that sits on some wall someplace that describes that, right? Uh, oftentimes it's in the back door, the front door. As you're walking out, you may see that particular plaque. How many of you have that plaque in your homes? Okay, most of you, quite a few of you have it, right? Um, have you thought about what that means? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Because in Joshua chapter 24, I want to look at verse 29. It says this, Now it came to pass after these things, that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. I'm not necessarily going to talk about death itself, today, but at the end of his life, he is described as the servant of the Lord. The question that caught my attention goes, how did he become known as the servant of the Lord? If you go back to the beginning of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, you'll notice something there. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, it talks about another death, which is the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. It says, after the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying. Some translations might say assistant, right? Um, but it's Moses' servant, the same word that is used. At the beginning of Joshua, he is known as Moses' servant or the servant of Moses. At the end of Joshua, he is known as the servant of the Lord. What I would like to do in this first session is understand how he became the servant of Moses. In the second session, this after dinner, we'll consider how he transitioned from being the Moses servant to the servant of the Lord. Those are the two studies that we're going to have this evening. Hopefully through that, we get an idea on maybe what our epitaph would be. Wouldn't it be really cool if all of our Epitaph said, the servant of the Lord. Right? I don't know about you, but I would love to have that. <clears throat> if somebody came to my tombstone, regardless of how long I lived, at the end of the day, it describes me as the servant of the Lord. I don't know if that's your aspiration or not, but it's a service that God wants us to be involved in. He wants us to be involved as the servant of the Lord. Now, uh, in it, I know in the flyers, I don't know if it's described in the flyers, but we talked about preparation for service and passion and service, and both of those fall into place. In preparation for service, you have how God prepared Joshua as a servant of Moses, and then in the passion of service, you see how he is known at the end as a servant of the Lord. If you would turn to uh, Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, it's the first time you will notice Joshua mentioned in the Bible. We know that Joshua was born into slavery. He is born into in Egypt as a slave, and actually you can say that he was a servant of Egypt. Now, after the Exodus, they come out and they go, uh, they go to the Red Sea. Uh, Moses brings them across into the wilderness, and in Joshua chapter 17, you have a situation where the Malachites came and fought against Israel. Look at verse 8. Now after Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephraim, and Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down the hand that Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand became heavy. 
So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Malak and his people with the edge of the sword. The question is, did, did Joshua really do the defeating in this story? Of course not. We read it, you know, looking back at this and say, God did the work. If Moses' hand kept on being tired and Aaron and Hur weren't there with him, Joshua would have lost in that particular scenario. And so God tells Moses in verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the members of Malak from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is My Banner. Now, we look at the story from Moses' perspective. We look at it from the perspective of the battle. But think about Joshua. It's the first time Joshua is mentioned. It's a first battle for the nation of Israel. Up until now, they have never fought a battle. You might find that surprising in this case. They left, um, they left uh, Egypt. God did all the fighting. They just had a walk out. They went all the way to the Red Sea. They were trapped between the Egyptian army that was coming at them and the Red Sea. They didn't fight them. God stopped them, opened up the Red Sea, walked through. You don't see a battle. You see the manna provided. You see the water provided. They complain and all these different things. And now they have the first battle. If you were to pick up a sword or a gun for the first time in today's, in today's language, how scared would you be? I would. I wouldn't even know what to do. And here, Joshua not only had to do that, he had to lead a whole group of men to go out and do that. He's not a strategist. We think of Joshua as this mighty strategy-related man at this point, going out ready for battle. That's not until the book of Joshua. At this stage, he is nervous, he is young, and he doesn't even know what he's doing. And he has to go out and fight a battle. He has to lead this group of men where he may potentially, along with many of them, could die. When Moses recounts the story, he has to tell him, Joshua, it was God who protected you. It was God who provided for you. The victory was all of God's. You see, when Moses or Joshua would read the book of the law, and we read this in Joshua chapter 1, right? He would come to this passage in the book of Exodus. I wonder what he went through in his mind every time he comes here. Notice in verse 14, write this as a memorial and a remembrance of what took place in your first battle. You see, when Joshua goes into the rest of his life, he has to remember that when he serves the Lord, it's the Lord who does the work and not him. However big or scary it may be, it's the Lord who does the work. He was supposed to remember it. He was supposed to memorize it. And Moses taught him that. I wonder how much Joshua really knew about the things of the Lord. He wasn't a spiritual man per se in this. The first action that you see Joshua taking in the book of Exodus is a fight, a physical battle. He's not thinking about spiritual things right here. He's actually going out doing something that Moses, who is the leader of the nation at this point, telling him to go do. Somebody picked him up and gave him an assignment to go do. And he took that opportunity and did it. The next time you see him is in Exodus chapter 24. I'm going to look at a few passages through Exodus through Deuteronomy as we prepare to that first verse in Joshua chapter 1. Exodus chapter 24, <clears throat> we have a situation where Moses is headed up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. In verse 9 it says, And Moses went up also, and then verse 10, And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like uh, the very, uh, I'm sorry, sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavy heavens uh, in its clarity. 
but on the um, yeah, and but on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand, so they saw God and they ate and drank. Then, verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses uh, rose with his assistant or servant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has difficulty, let him go to them. Now the story continues on. They go on into the mountain. Something that we often forget is that it wasn't just Moses who went up to the mountain. I, I always wondered, where was Joshua during this whole scene in the mountain? You know, we have this, uh, those of you who have seen the movie Ten Commandments or any of these renditions of the book of Exodus, Moses goes up there and he sees the glory of God and the thunder and lightning and all these different things that are up there. Even if Joshua wasn't right next to Moses, he was closer than everybody else to the glory of God. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, Joshua was very close to it. So later on, when Joshua becomes a leader, the book of the law and the law itself was very memorable to how he was going to live. He remembered the power of God. He remembered the glory of God. You know, when Moses comes down later on in the mountain, you see the fact that Moses' face was shining with glory. He had to put a veil on. Joshua saw that first before any of the children of Israel did. He saw the holiness and glory of God through Moses that Moses was able to lead, uh, teach him on. And so right here you have this situation where he goes up to the mountain. Now the story goes on and we're not, the intent is not to look at the story in itself, but turn to ch uh, chapter 32. Um, the golden calf scenario happens. They go back up to the mountain and they're going to get a second version of the tablet. On the way back, you see a situation in verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was a writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard, that means Joshua was with Moses as they were coming down, when Joshua heard the noise of the people, and the noise of the people were a noise of sin, that was taking place. They were dancing around a golden calf. They were uh, debauchery all over the place. When, they, when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. Moses cracks him. That's not voice of war. That's not vo voice of a victory or any of this. It's a voice of sin that was coming forward. Joshua wasn't too far off, actually, when you think about it. Sin is war against God. Joshua recognized it. He just saw the Ten Commandments. I'm sure Joshua read both sides of the tablet on the way back. And he saw that the Lord God is God. Honor him. You shall not have any other gods before me. I wonder how near and dear the law was to Joshua in this situation. The next time you see him is in Exodus chapter 33. When, um, the, when he is picked out by Moses. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 we see, so the Lord spoke to Moses. Now the scenario here is oftentimes Moses would go into a tabernacle where he's able to talk to God and it says, describe it as face to face. A close relationship that nobody else really had in that nation at that time. So the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 11, face to face as a man speak to his friend and he would return to the camp. But after Moses was done, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from that tabernacle. He was, in essence, desiring that same relationship that Moses had. One nice thing is he was described as a young man. 
He was probably 40 years old at this time. The way that I calculated his age when he died to the time that he was here, he was around 40 years old. That kind of gives me some you know, goodness because I'm still considered a young man based on scripture, right? So you think about it, he was a young man looking at all the actions of Moses and wanting to follow everything that he did. Interesting, if you turn to Numbers chapter 11, there's a description of what Moses did with Joshua. Numbers chapter 11, you have uh, a scenario where um, the, the, that he describes these various young men that were there. In verse 28, um, it describes Joshua as, So Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' servant, one of his choice men. One of his choice men. In other words, Moses looked at a couple of men and he picked them out specifically for various reasons and various purposes. This relationship that is being built between Moses and Joshua is a relationship in many ways as a rabbi would do with his disciples. If you know the description of what rabbis do with his disciples in the, in the New Testament even, you have the student doesn't pick the teacher. The teacher picks the student. A, a student may express a desire to be a disciple of someone, but the rabbi makes the decision on, yes, please be my follower. The rabbi goes and picks them out and trains them and shows them. He's, they're chosen to be his disciple. It's not the choice of the, the, the disciple to choose the discipler. It's something that you see throughout scripture. You think about Elijah. He went and chose Elisha. Right? You think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He went and chose the twelve. You think about Paul. He went and chose Timothy and Titus. Question on the table is, for those of you who are a little bit older or mature in your Christian life, who have you chosen to go disciple? There is a young person out there waiting for us to disciple. So often we think that, oh, you know, young people don't want to talk to older people. I don't know if that's true. I'm pretty confident it's not. There may be some. Somewhere in their life, they're waiting for a mature person to come and work in their life. And not their parents, by the way. <laughs> We so often think that what is happening with our young people, I think older people oftentimes drop the ball and never go disciple them because they're afraid that the young person might, may, might say no. That's fine. There's other faithful men to teach. Second Timothy says this, doesn't it? Second Timothy chapter 2, You therefore, my son, Paul is telling Timothy this, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You have Paul who teaches Timothy who picks out a faithful man who teaches others also. Four generations of discipleship. For those of you who are, I don't know, advanced in physical age, the question would be, at one point in your life did somebody pick you up as a disciple. Is there someone that discipled you? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. There's a situation back home where um, there's a young man who was about to graduate high school, a good young guy. Um, he was looking at, you know, getting into college, I'm sorry, he was going into college, he was graduating high school and going to college, and and a whole slew of questions. And his, um, his mom and Gina are good friends and such, and so uh, somewhere along the way, he got a, he got a website that my dad manages, um, and the website, he has, dad's got all of his various notes and things like that. And so it was suggested, hey, why don't you go check out the website? 
right, and see if you can get any answers. So he went to the website, looked at it. He really liked the content. It was simple and it was understandable for him. And then he had, he had this great idea. Um, you know, the person who writes all this content lives only four miles from our house. Why don't I just go there? Now, the nice thing about it, he took the initiative. He came and said, hey, do you think I can come meet with you? He went and talked to Gina and then, and then eventually to dad. The young man came and sat for three hours just asking questions. Dad, afterwards I talked to him. He had one of the best days of his life. Why? He's able to sit, 70-year-old man talking to an 18-year-old guy about life. They, I, don't, I didn't see them open up the Bible once. He said, take a look at this verse. This verse says this. That's all it was. Basic life things from Scripture. The question would be, are we doing that with others? We so often think about ministries that are out there, and I think towards the end of Moses' life, he's actually thinking about who, which one of these choice men will take over. God is going to, God told Moses that, that Joshua was going to be the one that takes over. But Moses took the time for 40 years in the wilderness to train Joshua. We so often look at, um, you know, what happens to a ministry when you're gone. You hear stories about churches that are established, elders who are strong, establishing good things, and the, the vibrancy is over there. And then the elders, as they get older, start passing away. But then nobody was trained along the way to replace them, pick up the ministry. And over time, that church either completely changes or stops. I think if you think about it, we can hear or know many stories like that. What about Sunday school ministries? Is there a, another person that you can train to take your class so that if you're not there, they can? If you end up having to move because of work, the ministry continues to go on? Now, I'm not saying that it happens all the time and I, that I'm perfect in that regard. There's been plenty of times. I mean, I, one of the things that um, you know, Gina and I have always talked about is, you know, we had, we had this youth group meeting, you know, when we were here. Um, when we left, the, there was a scramble to a certain extent. Who's going to take over at Martin Road in that, in that specific ministry? And the Lord recovers, obviously. The Lord provides for those. But one of the things that, you know, I've always regretted about is I never thought about moving from Detroit. I didn't even think about that I would and I needed to train. But lessons learned. I didn't train anybody to take over that ministry. Now, I learned that lesson and applying that back in Minnesota. Whatever ministry I'm involved in, I'm wanting to find somebody so that I am out of a job, call it. You see, Moses was training a young man to be his servant. And I would challenge each one of us in the same way. Turn to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, you see another example of what is happening here. Numbers 13, um, Moses sends out the 12 spies, right? They go out to the land of Canaan, they come back, and only Caleb and, um, and Joshua comes back with a good report. And the, 12, the other 10 complain and murmur. You know, it's not that the other 10 disagreed with Joshua and, uh, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb says, yes, the land is good, it's prosperous, lots, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but man, there are big people there. We can't take it. We cannot fight it. And to a certain extent, Joshua was right, that, or the people were right, that we can't take it. But Joshua said, but the Lord will win us the victory. The other ten didn't necessarily disagree. They just said, we don't think we can fight this battle. And they complained against God. It's interesting, when Joshua was ready to go into the land, he already knew what the land looked like. Right? Him and Caleb were the only two in the whole nation 
when it came to Joshua's time, that knew what the land looked like. He knew what was coming. He knew where to go, how to go. He didn't know all the strategies, and we'll talk about that in the next session. It's actually an illogical approach to taking over a land. But uh, he trusted in God because he was going to a land that the Lord had showed him to take possession of. Numbers chapter 13, you see an interesting scenario. Moses comes in in verse 8. You'll notice that from the tribe of Ephraim, Oshea, the son of Nun. That's what his name was. His name means salvation. However, look at down to verse 16. Of all these men that Moses picks out, verse 16, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. He renames him, saying that he is going to be Yahweh is salvation. His birth name meant salvation. Um, Moses adds that phrase, Yahweh is salvation. A little interesting study that you can do on your own. The word Joshua is a Hebrew name, means Yahweh is salvation. The name Jesus is a Greek name saying the exact same thing. So Jesus could have been called Joshua in Hebrew. It would have been the exact same scenario. And so it's an interesting study because in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, we see Christ being the one who will save his people. And so you have a very good picture study of Joshua and the Lord Jesus Christ in that regard. And Joshua was one of those who entered that land and knew exactly what was coming. And you see the Lord Jesus Christ who went on ahead into heaven and knows, ex knows exactly where he's going to lead his people. And you have a very good parallel study for you to think about. And so you have Moses who transforms his name, describing him of what he was going to do for the nation of Israel. Looking ahead to Numbers chapter 27, you have a very interesting uh, situation happening over here also. Numbers chapter 27, looking at verse 18. And this is where we see Joshua becoming the leader of the nation and now also known as a servant of uh, Moses. Verse 18 of chapter 27 of Numbers. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun with you, a man in whom is a spirit, and lay your hand on him. Uh, set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. So the whole nation sees Joshua, and Moses is inaugurating him. And you shall give some of your authority to him, that all the congregation of Israel uh, may be obedient. He shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of Urim. At, that, at, at his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, and he and all the children of Israel with them, all the congregation. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua, set him before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation, and he laid his hands on him and inaugurated him, just as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. You have a physical inauguration where Moses now in the presence of everybody says, he is my follower. He is my disciple who will take over for me in this nation. What was wondered? Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. What does it tell us? Go into all the world and? What's that? Pre preach the gospel. Is that what it says? Make disciples. There is preaching involved. But Matthew tells us to make disciples, not just preach. See, we too often preach and stop there. <laughs> Does that make sense? Moses trained a young man to be his disciple. What did he do? He taught Joshua all the things of the Lord. Matthew chapter 28, it says, go and make disciples, teaching them all the things of Jesus Christ. We too often stop at just preaching. So Moses inaugurates Joshua. Now if we come to Joshua chapter 1, you have the inauguration that God has for Joshua. 
God commands Moses to do this in the presence of everyone. He recognizes Joshua. Actually, God actually talks to, um, to, to Joshua in Deuteronomy chapter 31, where it says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Do you remember that story where Joshua was waiting for Moses to be done with his face-to-face -face meeting with God? In Deuteronomy 31, Moses took Joshua with him and went and met with God face-to-face -face so God could inaugurate him. You see, first a man comes in and works in our life. And that man trains and teaches us and then eventually commissions us to a service as our disciple, then God comes in and says, I'm going to inaugurate him also. It's not the only, that's not the, it didn't, it's not a new pattern. It started way back then and it didn't stop. It goes all the way into the New Testament. Think about what, what, uh, what uh, Paul did with Timothy. He took Timothy along with him on his, one of his missionary journey, trained him what to do, and he gave him instruction and placed him in a local church and said, now go establish this church. By the end, it wasn't Paul who was spending daily hours with him. Timothy was talking to God. God worked in Timothy's life. Let, let, it says that let the gift that God gave you be exercised, Timothy, in the local church. Because that's the commission that you have. So God comes in and gives a preparation for Joshua. Let's look at verse 1 again of Joshua chapter 1 in closing. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Joshua, this great event that took place is traumatic not only for you, but for the nation. You know, the country, uh, the nation spent 30 days mourning for jo uh, Moses' death. I actually wonder what Joshua was going through during those 30 days. Not only the mourning, but now, Lord, what do I do now? The inadequacy that Joshua may have felt. But Moses is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. And, and we'll look at this in the next session as we have an introduction for that. But it's, it's the idea that God says, be strong, be courageous. I'm with you just like I was with Moses the ministry that God has commissioned you to. First, first, there's discipleship that we need to get involved in. Secondly, there is dedication that we need to uh, dedicate an individual into ministry and then give them direction on who the Lord is, the promises of God, the work of God, the word of God, because at this point in Joshua, Joshua is known as a servant of Moses. Now God is going to work with Joshua. He's going to establish a testimony, so by the end of it, he's going to be known as a servant of the Lord. You see, so often we take discipleship to a point where it's so complicated that we lose sight of the intent behind it. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he discipled. He talked to them, but he actually did a ton of work with them. Every single day, the disciples were doing the physical work that Jesus Christ was doing. Don't tell me he was opening up the, the scrolls and teaching them. He was talking about life skills, about God's ways uh, while they worked. I'll give you two examples. One external, one personal. On an external one, there's a book out there by Bill McDonald called uh, Discipleship Manual, I think it's called. In the introduction of it, in the foreword, Jabe Nicholson Jr. writes a story about his own son where a, uh, an older, not an older, like someone who was in his 30s invited his son who was in his teenager years and took him along to go and help a widow in their local church move from her house to an apartment place. She was getting old and she couldn't uh, continue to live on her own in her, in her house. And so this person was 30 years old, took a teenager, physically strong to be able to move her. After this whole day was done, his son comes home and tells Jabe Nicholson Jr., you know, Dad, 
It was good to sweat for the Lord. We would think that's just terrible phraseology, but he was correct. I don't think that 30-year-old opened up the Bible while they were moving furniture. But somewhere along the way, he was teaching a young man what it means to serve God's people. Isn't that a lesson from the Bible? I was fortunate enough to have a few people who discipled me when I was young. Um, I went to college. wasn't a bad kid or all that, but I wasn't necessarily walking with the Lord either. Um, not really interested in Bible study at church or anything like that, but did it out of obligation to a certain extent. Had a ton of open questions. Had a ton of open questions about why am I in the assemblies? Why am I even a Protestant? Do I, do I believe in God? All these different things come up when you're a freshman in college. There is a um, young man, I guess he was 30 years old at that time. Uh, my parents had entrusted his family, uh, or me to his family, to, to kind of take care of me. And, um, and he kind of knew something was off, right? So what he did was, and good strategy, if you guys ever want to take this on, he, he, he took me and said, hey, let's go to the, community, the, the gym that's part of campus and just play some ba ba basketball. And he introduced me to racquetball and just different things, right? Uh, as a college student, that was fun. Sure, let's go do it. It was someone that I knew. I was willing to spend an hour with him, and it was good to just get away. Um, it just turned out, after a year of basketball, I realized afterwards that he was really having a Bible study with me. Um, <laughs> he spent every Thursday for an hour playing basketball and teaching the Bible to me at the same time. I didn't know it. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew at the end of it, we had studied through the book of Colossians. Never opened up the Bible. And so for the next four years, I sat under him to learn. Today, I'm grateful. Didn't know anything about it back then. See, older people, we need to take up younger people and teach them. Someone has to pick them up. And it doesn't mean that I have to go and open up the Bible in a coffee shop. It might mean looking like a fool playing basketball with them because you're not good at it. But you can talk about why did you make this decision? What questions do you have? And not every young person will take that up. But there's some young person out there that's not your own child that is willing to do that. See, Joshua was Moses' servant. Does that make sense? Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many people in this world that is seeking a mentor. And help us we who are your servants, that we would be willing to mentor other people and teach. Point them to Jesus Christ so that the church can grow, that your kingdom would grow, that we would be able to show forth to the world how to live that separated Christian life for your honor and glory. We ask for your guidance this rest of the evening. Help us to enjoy our time together fellowship. We thank you for the food that's before us. We pray that you would bless that. Help us to spend time together thinking about your goodness in our life. And we just pray for all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.